Hi, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our Shopify partner session today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about the topic that we're going to be discussing over the next hour, which is 10 things you can and should do with SVG uh, with Chris Coyer. So I am Simon Heaton. I work here at Shopify as the head of our partner content. And as I said before, I'm super excited to have you all here for this webinar today. Uh, just so you know, we will be recording the webinar. So if you have to jump off or your connection drops or something, don't fret. We'll be delivering the webinar to everybody in an email in about a week or so once we've gone through and edited everything. Uh, and now on to our guests. Uh, we have Chris Coyer, who is a web designer and developer at CodePen, uh, the author of A Book of Parts Practical SVG, and a writer for CSS Tricks. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here, Chris. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Thanks to to the all of Shopify for uh, for inviting me and organizing this. It's really uh, it's really cool. So I have a I have a presentation for all of you. There's 125 people in this room. That's crazy. Through the power of the internet here. So I think I'm going to let's see. I think Simon needs to make me the presenter. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll just be transferring the reins over to Chris, who can dive into his presentation. Uh, and for everybody attending, if you have any questions for Chris at all, feel free to drop them into the questions panel, um, and we'll have some time designated near the end of his talk where we can answer uh, anything that you guys have asked. Yeah, this appears to be working. I'm going to share with you my entire screen. Fair warning, just last week I bought the widest monitor ever. It's one of those... <laughs> 34 inch wide one so it might be a uh, wider than the monitor that you're watching this on so hopefully it's not too awkward but uh, we tested it out yesterday and it seemed okay so yeah I'm gonna talk to you all about SVG today and and more than you know we're gonna look at some code and stuff but more than that even what I my goal for this talk is just to kind of hang out with you and talk about SVG and, and show you tons and tons of cool examples of what SVG is to kind of help develop your muscle memory of when to reach for it and, and just be excited about it so the next time you can use it, you do use it. Uh, but before we look at those zillions of examples I have prepared for you, I want to understand the basics of SVG and, uh, and kind of what it is. So kind of a last season on SVG to catch everybody up with uh, what SVG is. To, uh, so we're all on the same page. What SVG is, is a graphics format. It's, a, it's a literally a format for files that allow you to you know, display graphics uh, on the web and in other formats as well because it's an open format. But you're probably already familiar with so many of the other formats. I mean, I, I bet 99% of you are uh, familiar with JPEG and GIF and uh, 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 PNG and more modernly WebP. And you know that you can use those uh, in HTML just like this. Image with the source equals and then the file path to that graphic and then .jpeg or .png or .gif or whatever, .webp. SVG can be used exactly like that. You can just do that too. Image source equals and then the file path and dot SVG and use SVG that way. So if you even if you didn't know that, you can use vector graphics, the SVG format on the web just as easily as you can any of those other formats. So that's that's a fairly important thing to know. You don't need to know anything fancy about SVG to use SVG. Under the scenes, or <laughs> did I did I mix metaphors there? Under the covers, behind the scenes, it's uh, uh it's also different. The fundamental difference between SVG and all those other formats is that it's a vector format and not a bitmap or raster format. All the other four that I mentioned are just different ways to like algorithmically collapse these things. Pixels, you know, it's just pixel data. Uh, uh, different ways to compress it, a few different features, but by and large, all those other formats are pixels. Pixels, pixels, pixels. You know, just the, it's great for displaying photographic data, but that's about it. Anything that, you know, should be drawn in vector can be drawn in vector through SVG. SVG is not pixel data. There's nothing pixel related at all in, in, in SVG. It has its own coordinate system, uh, and it describes how something is drawn through math, through geometry, through put the pen down here, draw it over here, draw a curved line to here, draw a line back to where you started. That's what the syntax of SVG is. It's mathematical explanations of how to draw things. 
Uh, we can look at a picture like this, these lovely Day of the Dead masks, and I think a lot of us intuitively know that's vector artwork. That was set the pen down here, draw a curved line to here, draw a straight line to here, pick up the pen, draw a different shape over here. We can understand that this was drawn through vector commands. We just have some of that intuition, I think. So, you know, that's the fundamental part of SVG. What really is it? It's a syntax. You can look at it, read it, change it, understand it, manipulate it. You know, you know it's a lot like HTML. It looks like HTML. There's angle brackets. There's attributes and values and stuff in there. Uh, it looks a lot like HTML. It's, it's not HTML. It's SVG, but it's similar. It's resolution independent, meaning that these instructions for drawing things can be shown anywhere. It doesn't, you know, it ends up being drawn to pixels on the screen when you use it, but like, it doesn't matter. You could draw it the size of a billboard and it's just math that will scale up. Abs resolution has nothing to do with SVG. Uh, it's animatable, so just like you can animate a div, like the background color of a div, you can animate all that same stuff with SVG, uh, uh, but you're just, you're animating a fill color instead and transform values and all that's very animation friendly format. Uh, it's you know, just like you can get into a div with JavaScript. You can dig into SVG with JavaScript too. It's 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 JavaScript friendly place as well. It can be made to be quite accessible, uh, which we'll get into a little bit. It's an open standard format. There's no like fees for companies to use SVG. And, you know, probably the reason that it's talked about so much recently, you know, uh, by me and lots of other people, is because it's 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 very uh, the browser support for it is very good lately. You don't even have to worry about it so much. It's like SVG, sure use it is almost the point that we're at right now. There's lots of good software for it. There's desktop software, there's native software, there's mobile software. I've seen uh, uh, browser-based software for working with SVG. There's lots of tools for working with SVG, including JavaScript libraries specifically built for working with SVG, uh, and there's reasons for that. Uh, there's lots going on here. Mostly, I want you to think about SVG. I want you to know that it's amazing. I'm here to make sure that you know about it. I want you to be impressed by the format of SVG, and most importantly, I want you to actually reach for it, develop that actual muscle memory of reaching for SVG when you're working on a project uh, uh, that demands it because it's totally underused. I've been talking about SVG for years, and somebody will tell me, like, I, I haven't even gotten around to changing my logo to SVG yet. It's definitely not part of the muscle memory of the web yet to reach for SVG format uh, uh, when needed. So, yes, that's the point. This is the point I'm going to uh, uh, go back and forth from, is the muscle memory. You know, even if you listen to this talk, you may be excited about it, but one you actually get working on a project, you know, I see people all the time, you know, they're going, 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 oh, they have this vector format of a thing, and uh, they're just like, ah, I'm just going to slice it up and save it as a PNG and use it that way. And you're like, oh, that was it. That was the moment I wanted you to save it as SVG because it was... <laughs> Yeah, it didn't quite get there. So with that group, hopefully group understanding of SVG, uh, uh, the title of the talk is 10 Things You Can and Should Do with SVG. Here's an example of one of them, this classic chestnut making the logo bigger. It's been a little, been a minute since I've done client design work, but I've, 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 I've certainly had this, you know, this kind of classic moment. How about this, you know, I'll make your logo bigger. Uh, I'll do it right now. I'll do it right in front of you. I'm gonna dig in there. How big do you want it? Twice as big. You want it maybe three times as big. <laughs> We're just digging in the dev tools to do it right now. I'm doing this right on the Shopify.com website through the Chrome Dev Tools. Just for fun. Uh, and the overall point was look at how look you know, look at what Shopify used for their logo. We can, you know, look in there in the dev tools and see that they used SVG for this. I went in there, I made the logo three times as big, and it lost no quality whatsoever. And that's kind of part of the awesomeness of SVG is that, you know, you want to make the logo bigger, make the logo bigger. It will lose no quality. In fact, that looks amazingly sharp. We could have made it five times as bigger, uh, and it would have been okay. That's uh, in contrast to. Um, something like this, and I'm not even like trying to pick on Envision. I love Envision and use Envision. I think it's a good project, but they just, I happened to be on their site because I was using it and poked around at their logo. First of all, do you see I right clicked on it and it's like, do you want to download our logo? I was like, no, I want to, 
I want to uh, inspect your thing. It's normal. It's kind of a clever thing that they do. But see, I'm increasing the size of their logo, and it's lost a ton of quality because it's a PNG. It's made out of pixel data. It cannot scale up without losing quality. And uh, you know, as we all probably well know, that when you know when raster graphics are scaled up, they just look awful. You know, and it's like, well, then you know, don't do that. Would be the answer. You know. Eh, that's fine, although it, sometimes resolution changes without us ever asking for it to have changed. You know, a lot of this conversation came up when companies started shipping screens that were 2x or 3x or 1.5x or whatever. Resolution started to not be consistent in the world of screens, and we were shipping these quote-unquote 1x graphics, and all of a sudden images were starting to look like crap in there, and we're like, oh, shoot, no problem. I know what we'll do. We'll send four times the graphic data down the pipe to make sure that our graphics are are sharp. And that's fine, but that hurts web performance, and yeah, 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 yeah. You know, these type of things, particularly a logo like this, could have been solved uh, nicely with SVG. In fact, I actually found a, a browser extension for Chrome called Make the Logo Bigger, and I was just poking around at sites just for fun. There's the CSS Tricks logo. I click the button. The code pen logo gets blasted up. Here's the GitHub. I was surprised at how good it was at identifying the logo on the page and and blasting it up. And all these three examples use use SVG, uh, which makes it not a problem at all. So the, the kind of the, the point here is that, yeah, logo is fine. We're talking about logos. That's a good baby step for a lot of people is like, let's just make the logo SVG there, you know, dip our toes in the water. But logos are just images. There could be any graphic on the entire side. It could be a diagram in a blog post. It could be a, a background image of something. It could, it could be anything. The point I'm trying to make here is, of course, the resolution independence of SVG is so cool because uh, it just can be scaled to any size and you never have to worry about it. You know, Just to put a point on it, it's so nice not to have to worry about it. You could ship a 10x display tomorrow and I don't have to revisit my code base because it's just going to, SVG will just look all the better that day. It's so great. It's so it's great that we have you know responsive images in HTML now to deal with our JPEGs and only serve the right sizes to the right places and stuff. It's nice, but it's complicated it's not complicated with SVG. You just send the same file everywhere, and it's so nice. Here's me weeping tears of joy and increasing the size of my tears because I love this so much. I don't have to worry about it. I like SVG. All right, on to the real number one here is, is uh, SVG is super great for charts and graphs. As we covered, SVG is made out of math, so why not use it to display math? You know, this is a classic case of something that SVG seriously excels at. So just to just to wet our teeth here a little bit or whatever, I think I'm mixing metaphors all day today. Uh, uh, let's look at some charts in increasing order of aesthetic attractiveness. Uh, pie chart can be useful, pretty boring. Next. Ooh, line chart. This is made from little straight lines, and the lines are differentiated by different little nubbies on there for when it changes. Yeah, it's good. It's okay. Uh, how about this one? Ooh, line chart, but nice little nubbies and animated. SVG can certainly do that. That's our first little taste of SVG animation here. That's looking good. How about this one made with, uh, looks like a library called Chartist. Uh, the background is, is a nice SVG. That looks cool. The, and the lines aren't straight here. Lines don't have to be straight in SVG. They can be curved, clearly. Uh, and the lines are differentiated between each other with different strokes, different stroke thicknesses, different stroke colors, and if you'll notice, different dashes and gaps in there. We have the control over that in SVG as well, which is a nice change from CSS where we don't really have control over that. Uh, here's another curved chart, but this one, ooh, look at those lines fly in, and the th line draws itself. How nice is that? Let's watch it again. I like how the background lines kind of flash as they come in. That's a really nice look for a chart. Uh, here's another line chart, but it, there's some dimensionality to it. These are shapes that are stacked on top of each other uh, uh, to, to, to look good. And this one has some interactivity as well. So where we're hovering over, it's displaying us some information uh, about where our mouse happens to be hovered over. So that's pretty cool. You can have interactivity and a nice look, lots of nice colors, displaying nice data that way. Here's a, one that's taking in real-time data. It's drawing curves, and it's tracking the, mi the minimum and maximum values at each x-coordinate there. So it's taking in live data and tracking it that way. 
That's a nice chart, I think. How about this one from the homepage of AM charts or AM charts? It's like a three-dimensional wall. It's got interactivity and it just looks amazing. You can tell how that's vector art. That was drawn with arbitrary data, but it was drawn uh, through vector points and graphs. This is all stuff you can do uh, with SVG. Infographics is another big one for, for SVG, and it's one where all the time I'll like see a cool infographic and then I'll like view source on it and it's like a JPEG or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's so sad because it's so clear that cool infographics like this were made with vector graphics. So it's like, wh what happened when you wanted to export it? You know, I feel like that was a golden opportunity to leave it as a vector format, which would make it more accessible and give you more styling opportunities and animation opportunities that, that were lost. You can see here, this would be a great use for SVG uh, and vector format on the web is uh, something like this that you could make responsive and stuff. We'll look at that in a minute. All right, number two of things SVG can do. One of them is a really weird one called shape morphing. That's not an official term. It's just kind of describing what's ha happening uh, here. SVG has this thing called Smile that's kind of built into it that's like a sub-language that's all about interactivity and animation within SVG. Uh, and it's still around. It's not supported in absolutely all browsers, and its future is a little weird and uncertain, but it had this ability to animate things that you couldn't animate any other way, without, not even in JavaScript, not in CSS. And one of those things was like the actual point data that shapes had. You could, that was something that you could animate in Smile, and that's what's happening with that save button below. The actual points that make up that shape are being interpolated uh, and, and animated, which is just such an interesting, cool thing. Now, because Smile's future is uncertain and even its past was sketchy and stuff, uh, Greensock, which is a, a library that's good for animating all kinds of things, it's good at SVG animation, but really it can animate anything, has a plugin for it that specifically deals with SVG animation, and they said, we can, we're going to take this idea, we're going to make it work in any browser, we're going to make it really performant, we're going to give it lots of options, and make it part of our library, and they released this Morph SVG plugin that's so cool here. Now, look at this little movie they put out as a promo for it. That's not like After Effects or some you know weird movie software or anything like that. These are just shapes right in the browser, right in the DOM, that are just shapes being morphed and switched and moved around and stuff. It's just a really cool thing that's possible now directly on the web. Uh, I think it's really powerful. So so that's <laughs> here's me. I, I found a certain famous person's signature on the web and 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 gave it to the Green Sock library to animate. One of the cool things about it is with Smile and with native CSS animation, we'll look at the points. You have to give it the exact same number of points, and it was a little tricky and stuff. You can just throw anything at the Green Sock library, and it will figure it out a way to animate it. So. It's just such a such a cool library, I think. This one does not use, um, it uses some other morphing library. I forget the name of it. I have links to all this stuff, though, uh, in the PDF that we can send of these slides. You can click through to stuff. This is like an infographic of the shape and size of cell phones over time. I just think that's such a, it's a neat, compelling thing to watch, I think. You know, this would be a, a great interactive piece in some journalism that happened to be about phones or something. It's fun to watch by itself, but certainly it could complement um, uh, a story or something like that. Here's an advertisement that I put on my own site, uh, CSS Tricks, that I put together for a sponsor of my media temple. Uh, and I was like, well, let me take your logo and I'm just going to morph it into icons that represent um, your brand and your offerings. So I just took little pieces of the logo and just morphed it into some of their icons that they designed to do that. So it's just like a kind of a compelling little, uh, little, little thing to watch as an advertisement. It has some interactivity and it's kind of like a banner ad but a little better because it uh, has actual interactive hover states and stuff kind of a fun thing. So here's some hot news that's just kind of had dropped in the last few weeks that I think you should uh, probably be aware of because it was very exciting for me to find out. So here on the top is I, I have an X drawn with path data and there right in the CSS I'm using the D property to change that path data. And not only that, I applied a transition to it. So now we have that like like SVG morphing effect in which we, we use nothing. We didn't use smile syntax. We didn't use JavaScript. We didn't use the green sock library. We're just using just raw CSS here and we're getting this 
um, transition morphing effect happening. So this is pending change, I think. Uh, I don't think it'll ever be ripped out of the browsers that it's in now, but the syntax might change a little bit. But even now, in stable Chrome, this, this is shipping. Uh, which is pretty cool, and it can be quite uh, you know a progressive enhancement thing if you if you kind of do it the right way. So here I've even added a, an active state to it. When you click it there, it's changing. Uh, so kind of cool. Uh, here's another example of the same thing. Well, I was recently kind of working and digging in and figuring out the path syntax. You can see lots of different path commands along the left there. Uh, I was figuring out how to draw different types of curves and stuff like that. And then through CSS, I was like, I want those curves to change to this path and animate them. So here's nine examples of just, you know, look, look at how little code was required to do that. Just tiny, just a few bytes of code. Uh, to get these fun shapes and animated fun shapes, you know, just the performance there is is pretty crazy. So, again, this is a point I want to make throughout this. You know, th these things I'm showing you, I want you to like lock them in your memory somehow and reach for SVG like when you have a situation of a project you're working on uh, uh, that that could call for it, could use it. Actually, give it a shot. So here's number three. Number three is line drawing. Just a little clever little fun thing you can do uh, through SVG that I can explain. I think this got popular a number of years ago through this article on polygon.com when they were releasing the PlayStation 4. They did a review and they made a really beautiful website just for the review. And I think it's appropriate. It has this kind of blueprint like effect to it, you know, and, and, and they were, you know, it's a review of hardware. So I feel like uh, it had a it had a good look to it, and it, and it popularized the idea a bit, and people kind of ran with it after that. And to this day, I see demos being dropped on CodePen of just little simple things like this. Like it's just so compelling to watch. Every time you're like, "Well, what's it gonna draw? Oh, it's a little bear!" You know, it's like it has this exciting moment, even for something totally out of context like this. It's just kind of fun. And remember that. These things don't have to exist in isolation. Here's just the animation that animates in through opacity. You can see this fork slide in, then it draws itself. You can kind of combine these ideas to pretty compelling animations that um, easily happen you know, right on the web. So that's a pretty fun one. Uh, I wrote a, a blog post called How SVG Line Animation Works. If you'd like to find out, I can explain it actually pretty quickly. Imagine you have like a, 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 a I wonder if I can turn on my, my, uh, oh, I lost my mouse because I'm a keynote. Sometimes it's, it's, I can explain this with my hands. It's kind of fun. But imagine you had like the shape of a hand. Let's say that. And it was drawn in an SVG path. Remember I said in the beginning that you could control the, the length of a dash and the length of a gap when you're describing the describing the uh, uh, a stroke in SVG. Now imagine you told you, you you were defining that and you said I want the stroke to be so long that it covers the entire shape. So it's technically a stroked path, but it's covering the entire shape, so it doesn't really look stroked. Then you said, I want the gap after that to be also as long as the entire shape. And another thing that you can control is uh, 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 the offset of that. So you could say, okay, also offset at 50%. Then it's going to draw half of the shape of my hand because the gap is as, is, as long as my hand and the, and the line, the, you know, the piece of the stroke that you can see is that side. So you can actually say offset at 100%. Offset it so far that you can see nothing on the screen at all. Then animate it back to not being offset at all. So you can imagine that over time, that offsetted stroke is just going to and come back on the shape. That's all it is. It's just a little trick. It's just you can do it right in CSS. Just animate the offset of a really long stroke. That's how it works. And you can draw stuff like this. This is the animation of lots of different little paths doing it. And the, you know, to reveal the word think there is just so cool. You know. You can imagine that happening as you scroll down a page or something like that. Uh, you know, here's some recent branding stuff by Fitbit, which is all, you know, it's a brand that's all about movement and data and tracking and stuff. I feel like the movement of the drawn lines is really cool there. Also from thick to thin, which is a cool metaphor uh, for Fitbit. And, you know, how the shapes moving around kind of metaphorically represent data. I think it's just such a nice look for them utilizing the same kind of stuff. Uh, so number four here, using some of this stuff to animate interface that you build on the web. Um, so here's a demo, and before I play it here, uh, the concept is called transitional interfaces. And nothing here that you're going to see is SVG, but it's more of a concept. 
And Pascal's idea was that you can understand things easier through transitions in interfaces easier, your brain can latch onto it better. You know, I'm sure you've heard like, you know, I don't know, when, when you, you see somebody come into the room through a corner of your eye and your eye latches onto it right away, theoretically because something, something, cavemen, tigers in the corner of your eye, you know, whatever. Our eyes are trained to understand movement and changes like that better than not. So this first demo, there's a new list item appearing and you know, if it wasn't green, you could probably wouldn't be able to tell it was there at all. This one, it pops up. You know, I don't know, hopefully, you know, through this webinar you can see that animation. This one slides down and then the new item slides in. It helps your brain understand what's happening in these demos better just because there's some movement happening. This this thing comes out of nowhere and flies into place, you're like, oh, I get it. There's a new thing there. It just helps people understand the interface better. And I feel like through movement, any interface could potentially benefit. Here's some really whimsical examples of radio buttons and a range slider by Chris Gannon, who makes tons of amazing demos uh, on CodePen and, and does client work that does amazing stuff. And it's kind of like, these are just fun and funny, and if you can get away with using them, why not? Because they just add so much little whimsical fun to an interface. But also, like, it does kind of make it clear that you click on a different radio button and the thing zooms over there. You're like, it changed. I get it. Oh, I'm changing a range slider. Oh, a giant balloon is telling me what's going on. It moved into place. I get it. It helps me understand that more than a range slider that didn't have that. So that type of thing. Here's just, you know, we see lots of load, loader examples on CodePen. This is a really fun one where the stroke is being animated and the shape is being animated. It would make me, like, want to make my web app slower just so that I could see this animation more often because it's so beautiful. This by Rachel Smith. Um, here's a here's a here's an animation where the motion path, which is another thing you can do in SVG, was tied to um, the scroll position. You know, as I scroll down, this guy's being animated on the path. But there's also animation that's just just happening anyway, like the clouds going around, and there's some shape morphing going on, and it's and in his tie and his hair is being animated back and forth a bit. So it's kind of a combination of things happening here. Just fun. I'm sure you're, you know, it's easy to get your mind reeling on like little ways you can use stuff like that. Here's an interface uh, from a web app called Clip that is shows audio forms of a recorded piece of audio. We use it on Shop Talk Show and people send in audio clips. It's kind of like, just go here and record it because it can just happen right through the browser and then send us a link to that kind of thing. It's pretty useful. And then as you play the audio clip, you can see the sound form and the how far you are traversed in the audio sound clip and stuff. That thing, you know, as a JPEG or something would be bigger and harder to control, but because it's SVG, it's just a lot easier to animate and produce dynamically and stuff. It's just it was definitely the right choice for for something like this. Uh, speaking of audio things, here's like a preamp, an equalizer kind of thing, which with range inputs where you can see this line being drawn dynamically to connect these dots. It has this lovely shadow underneath it, really nice gradients, which are absolutely possible in SVG. Uh, it's just, you know, a nice interactive piece uh, through SVG. This is a cool demo by a guy named Jake Alba that is, um, who works with me, called the Musical Chord Progression Arpeggiator. So it, it allows you to make chord progressions of arpeggios. Arpeggio is like a chord, but imagine if you just strummed all the all the strings of a guitar at once, that's a chord, but if you played each note individually, that's an arpeggio. And so this thing was built to make a chord progression like C, E, G, A minor, whatever, and play them in a row, but 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 play the arpeggios of those chords. So it makes, you know, do 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 kind of songs, you know, that can be quite beautiful and interesting. And this is like, do you want a main major or minor? What chords do you want to play? What key? How fast? That kind of thing. But also in all those shapes along the bottom, uh, in what order do you want me to play that arpeggio? So uh, it, he could have just said zero, three, one, four, five. That's fine. That play those the no, you know those note numbers correspond to which note of the chord do you want to play? But it's just more fun and more compelling and easier to understand if you draw a little diagram that you know is a coordinate of that in in what order. I thought it was a really clever use of SVG and it requires super little code to do it. In fact, if we look in the dev tools there, you can see that that's a polyline element that just takes XY coordinates in SVG and draws a line between them. 
and there's a little bit of SC, SVG that says make it black and make sure that the ends as it goes around the bend are nicely rounded. So here's like a really big example of one of those. Remember, SVG can be drawn at any size. It doesn't matter. SVG with a view box on it will kind of, kind of behave like a display block kind of thing, and make itself really big. And that's one of those polylines that he drew. Really easy thing to do. I'm not sure how the sound we're going to go, but I thought it would be unfair if I showed a demo like that and didn't show it actually working. So uh, it says audio computer audio, so maybe this will work. I have no idea if you can hear it or not. If you couldn't hear it, rest assured, it was very soothing. <laughs> and here's an SVG demo that, again, matches interactivity in animation and sound. Uh, through a pretty cool demo. So this one, as I click, it plays a chord. <laughs> oh, pretty cool. Here's there's this like kind of subculture of music people on CodePen that make interesting things like this through JavaScript. This one ties together animation and SVG and interactivity and sound and it's got keyboard events in here to control it. So I can click on these things or I can use the keyboard. They animate as I click them, make sound. Love it. So it's such a cool demo. Uh, uh, and somewhat easily possible through SVG. So maybe you all have heard of this one, SVG Icon Systems. It's a big one that, that I think is cool and believe in and is one of those things that SVG is kind of built for because, get this, one of the elements, and there's really not that many different SVG elements, uh, is called Symbol. And it's this, it's this element that's specifically, it's specifically for icons. It says, take this piece of SVG and don't even draw it. I know what you're trying to do here. I know that you're trying to just define a little bit of something so that you can use it again later and you can use it as many different times later as you want to. Just define it now, use it later. That's what symbol is all about. And the idea of it was, what a perfect thing for icons. It's something that's natively built into browser that's for icons. It's one of the reasons I feel so strongly about it. This is how it works. You have some SVG code, and you have these symbol tags in there, and you can give each symbol an ID, just like you might give a div an ID or whatever else. And you have a view box on I know we didn't cover view box very much, but it's kind of the coordinate system for SVG. It's not that complicated at all. This coordinate system starts at 0, 0, goes to 100, 100. It could start at negative numbers. It could get huge. It could get small. It's just saying this is the, this is the numbers that I want to define as a coordinate system, so when you draw 10, 10, you, know, you can see it in here. And, and it's a, a tenth of the way down and a tenth of the way across. And you can put accessibility information inside there, like a title, which will be read out loud when this is like tab two or something like that, which is great. Very easy to make SVG icon system accessible. Uh, and then whatever you else. In this case, I have a path in there. It could be 10 paths. It could be polylines. It could be filters and crazy stuff. Literally anything that SVG can do, you can put inside of a symbol. There's no limits. And then we have a bunch of them. And in our case, we're just using simple path data, and we're saying, here's an icon. X, a saving icon, an arrow icon, and we have this chunk of SVG. Then you put that, or I should say that to get that, you could handwrite it if you want to. I have, but there's all these tools out there, you know, Gulp, Grunt, there's browser tools, there's lots of tools that will take a folder full of SVGs that you've created. That's how a lot of us work with SVG icon systems anyway, and it'll just smash them all together and give you that chunk of code that you see on the right. So it's not a hard thing to make. It can be totally automated. Then you take that and you put it somewhere in your HTML document. Uh, and then anytime you want to use one of those icons, this is how you do it. You say SVG, use, and then reference the ID of the symbol that you've made before, and it will draw that icon right there. That's as simple as it is, and it's, it's accessible, works great, and not to mention you can animate it and style it and all that type of stuff. It's pretty cool. So here's that in use on CodePen. I, I don't just you know talk about this. I use an icon system like this. Here's a... Uh, uh, uh. Okay, now there's some more examples of that coming up, but just you know, to put a point on it, why would you do it this way instead of any other way that you can use icons? Well, they're vectors. You get that advantage. You can show them at any size. They're super crisp. You have that strong CSS control. I can style this one different than this one, even though they're the same shape. I could have them be multicolor if I want to. I, can, I have more CSS control than I normally do because I can control the stroke in all those interesting ways. I can get in there and animate it. I can get in there with JavaScript. I can make them match the font size that they're around and their color easily, just like I could with icon fonts. 
And speaking of icon fonts, there's a lot of advantages compared to them. They just they don't fail as weird. It's easier to make them accessible. Uh, it's easier to position them. Lots of reasons. I have a blog post called Icon Fonts versus SVG Cage Match that goes into many more reasons than this. But I think uh, if you're comparing the two, that SVG icons really have the edge. Maybe some of you have heard of this one. This is um, called Grunticon by the Filament Group, and it's also awesome. In fact, if everybody in the world used this icon system, I think that would be great, too. It has a slightly different approach than the one I just described, but it still starts with a folder full of SVGs and gives you, it gives you everything to use to need to use those SVGs, and it actually progressively enhances up to inline SVG as well, so the end result is the same. It just takes the kind of the opposite way to get there. Uh, and if you like Grunticon, and one of the advantages to using Grunticon is the fallbacks are great. They fall back to, like, anything ever. It has very good deep browser support. If you are interested in what I just described and like the fallback situation of Grunt Grunticon, even that's not out of the question. I have an article about that, and, again, all these links are in the PDF that we'll make available to download. Uh, here's the CSS Tricks website, me using inline SVG system on it. Here's github.com. They use an inline SVG system. Um, this blank one, I was going to put a screenshot of Shopify in, and apparently forgot to do that or didn't drag it in in time, but shopify.com uses an inline SVG icon system. Trulia.com here, the real estate search, uses an inline SVG icon system. I, you know, I could fill 100 slides. It's not rare. It's like uh, lots of big uh, sites have jumped onto this for the look of it and the performance, there's just a, there's a, a million reasons. Because they've learned to reach for SVG like I want you to. Uh, here's another one. Art. One of the reasons you could SVG is because it has all these amazing design possibilities. And there's, you know, sometimes there's no better reason to do something just because you feel like doing it. Because you want to express yourself and do something artistic. Uh, here's just a random, <laughs> beautiful little artwork of some crazy future art clouds, <laughs> the rocket, and this uh, thing being animated through here. And it's using a clip path, which is another thing that's available in SVG to say, you know, I want some stuff to happen under here, but crop it to the outsides of this kind of thing. SVG has clip path available to it to do things uh, like this. It has masking available too, which is the difference between clip path is like you're either in or you're out of a clip path, whereas a mask has like gray, can possibly have gray areas on it. It's defined by pixel data, really, that does that, just in case you're interested. How about this weird little balloon by Tiffany Rayside, you know? This is certainly just artistic expression happening, you know? It's very, very likely a client didn't ask for that balloon, I would say. Why don't you unleash the kids to do some art? This is just some SVG shapes that um, Sarah Drasner attached some draggableness to in the browser. So you can kind of play around with Mr. Potato Head and make the art happen that way. Why not? Fun stuff there. This is one of my more favorite demos of the last couple of years, really, from uh, David Piano, who actually made the shapes from this dog out of divs and spans or whatever. He made it, the shapes and filled the shapes uh, as HTML elements, which is totally fine. It's just it actually probably would have been easier to do in SVG, but uh, it's still kind of fun. But look at how weird. Hopefully this is coming across the webinar okay. It's got this squiggle vision crazy Dr. Katz thing happen on, happening, which is just... It's cool. And I thought it was an extremely clever thing that David figured out. There's filters in SVG. And CSS has filters too, you know, like you can make something grayscale or sepia tone or whatever. You could do all that stuff in SVG as well, but SVG's filter game is strong. And it's barely being tapped into, I feel like, on the web. This particular filter is called the turbulence filter, which takes a shape and like messes up the shape a little bit. And it's really easy to dial the knob of turbulence too strong and really super crazily mess up a shape. This is like 0.001% turbulence. There's some really low number of turbulence being applied to these shapes. But what's exceptionally clever about this is, you know, it just took a it just took like a div and applied some SVG turbulence to it, which is a thing that you can do. You can kind of combine worlds like that. But what makes it squiggle is that David didn't just make one of these filters for turbulence. He made like five or six of them or something. And they all just did a little, dialed the knob a little bit differently. And there's multiple knobs you can turn. 
uh, and then through CSS keyframe animation said, apply this filter, then take it away and apply this filter, and then take it away and apply this filter, and do that with a steps keyframe animation. So that's what's happening under the scenes here. So it's SVG filters being applied to HTML elements with a keyframe animation. And it just gives it that really cool look. I love it. Um, oops, let me go back to the one before that. This is a uh, just bubbles floating around which is a, f a fun enough demo by itself, but these, these particular bubbles have turbulence applied to them, so it ad just adds some extra kind of fun, weird, artistic quality to, to the shapes. Here's just, this is just a fun little demo where you can um, pick from pre-existing images, uh, but also just drag and drop and upload an image, and it does this crazy mathematically calculated polygon ization of it. It's like you can make art in like 10 seconds with no work at all. And it ends up with these beautiful results and you can do you can do a lot. You know, you can crank this thing up to like thousands of points to get it fairly accurate or dial it down to just a few points to get it less accurate. You know, there's kind of a lot you can do with this uh, called Cubist. It's really fun by William Gann. Why don't you polygon a tiger up and then explode it? Why not? There's some JavaScript that's kind of grabbing these polygon slices and uh, changing their opacity and rotation and position and stuff, and it leads to kind of a crazy, compelling effect that actually isn't particularly difficult, you know? Apply, a, you know, get a few, do a little randomization in JavaScript and do a loop to get all the polygons and blast them together. I'm sure there's some clever behind the scenes stuff going on, but this type of thing isn't thousands of lines of code, it's like dozens of lines of code, you know? <laughs> These just crazy trippy circles, you know? I don't know what makes people do this stuff, but you can do it, so they do it. Uh, and as a reminder, these things, these clipping paths and line drawing and shape morphing and opacity changing and movement and all the other things you're used to from it, animation can be combined together. This is Sarah Drasner who works uh, with me at CSS Tricks, designed our, took our logo, put a little toggle in the dash, and when you click the toggle on CSS Tricks, it just unleashes some crazy uh, uh, and has, does a little timeline animation that morphs uh, does all kinds of crazy stuff to the logo. So don't be afraid to combine ideas. Certainly that's what makes animations compelling at all. This is one of my more favorite things you can do with SVG actually is, is, is explain something. Do kind of a diagram setup. And we looked at infographics a little bit. Here's another infographic that explains and brings together some data from the Olympics and has uh, it has, but the important thing is there's, there's text set in the SVG, which I think is kind of interesting. You can, that's something that's absolutely possible to do in SVG is uh, bring text to the party. Here's a little demo by Shirley Wu who took the top five most popular films each year and said, okay, the rating means it has this flower petal shape. The, uh, the genre means it has this color how many votes it has is how many leaves it has. And that kind of, and it turns out that each movie had created its, uh, a different flower shape from that programmatically, which is a, kind of a clever idea. Oops, I went back in time there. But here's one of my more favorite use cases of it that I want to use more and more and see more and more because it's really clever. So this is a, a, a blog post by Jake Archibald who wanted to show off some pieces of code in this blog post. And there's nothing more, you know, when you're talking about code, you should have code that you can copy and paste in the blog post, of course. We, we need that to do what we want to do. But here he was like, I don't want to just leave code comments in there. I want to point out individual little pieces and, 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 and with some whimsy and with some, you know, a good look to it, draw arrows and use like a scripty font and say, look at this, this is, a, this is what's going on with this individual piece of this code. So he made a graphic like this, the thing that we're looking at right there in the middle of the post. You might be think, I like that, that's cool, I, I, I see what he's doing there, it makes it more understandable, but so how would you go about that? Maybe you'd you know, set your code editor to a white background theme and you take a screenshot and you bring it into Photoshop and rotate it and uh, then draw the arrows and stuff on there and then I'll output the whole thing as a PNG or something. I would do that. I have done that many times. But that's not actually what's going on here. This is selectable text. This is, this whole thing is just one little tiny, tiny piece of SVG. It's not individually drawing with polygons these letters. 
you don't have to do that in SVG. You can actually set web text in SVG, and you can rotate the whole thing trivially easily, and you can draw those arrows trivially easily, uh, and you can use custom web fonts that are available like you can on any web page in SVG. All this is very easy to do in SVG. So here's me. I'll just dig into the dev tools a little bit so you can see what's going on here. These are It's literally called the text element in SVG, and here I'm just changing values. Those T-span elements you see are useful for positioning, to, for moving around the text where it needs to go. But here's me changing values in it in real time. It's just a web font. And here, you know, it shows you that this is scalable. It maintains its quality uh, as you resize it. And it's, so it's everything. It's selectable code. I can copy and paste this and paste it right into a code editor. It's accessible. People reading this can, can tab to it and will read the code out loud. It's SEO friendly. You know, for the search engines that are looking at the site can read this data. Uh, it's great. It could have responsive design attached to it. He could be like, oh, this is getting too small. I'm going to remove the arrows and shift them things around and stuff. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that later, uh, which is kind of cool. So it's just this perfect use case for SVG, I think. I wrote a blog post about that um, just as a meta opportunity here, wrote about uh, the SVG syntax, and I did the same exact thing. I thought that was so cool to set text in SVG that I set this text in SVG and made these demos and, and, and points and stuff in the same exact format that, that Jake did. So, yeah, I want to put a point on the fact that you can um, set text in SVG, and then here's a blog post about it on CSS Tricks that's called, you know, small, scalable, accessible typographic design. Here's just a little piece of SVG that I created in which that, it's, first of all, it's using web fonts. It's using fonts that I just grabbed off Typekit, you know, and, and, and made a little test kit and used those. And then I set the word graves, and I'm doing this in Illustrator. I've used Typekit, and I've activated the fonts locally so that I could work with them in Illustrator. I designed this, drew some shapes in Illustrator. Then I took the word graves, and I set it between, like, the ascenders of the M and the T there, which is something that you would just, like, never do if we are just working with HTML. Because, like, if the fonts fail, it's going to look really weird. If there's cross-browser rendering differences, it's going to look really weird. With responsive design, you know, what if some, what if the text gets cut off weird because it doesn't, it doesn't responsively size? Um, what if, like, at or certain responsive designs, I nudge the font sizes of things around because I'm changing font sizes, like, at the body level or whatever? Uh, that's going to make this design break. This thing is super duper fragile if we've set it with like an H1 and span and stuff. But let's not do that. I designed the thing in Illustrator. I can export to SVG right from Illustrator. It's going to have the right fonts because I've designed with the right fonts uh, in mind. And it ends up with this. It ends up with a scalable thing. And I'm just changing the size arbitrarily here in the browser. And, and I'm proving that these are using web fonts by toggling those fonts off on the page. We have this like typographic lockup situation that's totally resizable, scales perfectly, uh, and is still selectable and stuff. I think that's an, that's an awesome use case for SVG. So uh, that was kind of a little ad, right? Here's Chris Gannon again saying, you know, these ads that you see, these animated interesting ads on the web, or debatably interesting, I guess, um, could be little chunks of SVG. Retina ready, he's saying. They're flexible, they're accessible, they're lightweight, they are high performance. That just everything is so cool about using it in that way. I feel like advertising should make the shift over to it. So I said the word headline lockup. Let's look at that for just a second here. A headline lockup is like I'm setting text to be just like this. I don't want it to be subject to little movements. I don't want the font to ever fail. I don't want wrapping to happen. It's like I'm setting text, but it's it's a piece of art. It's, it needs to be just the way I've designed it, like these demos here, like these demos here. There's lines around the text that need to be just the way it is. SVG is great for that kind of thing. The word comes from, literally, we're looking at like the bed of a Vandercook press here, a, a, a letterpress printing press, and there's literally old wooden letters here being smashed together with a clamp that you can't see. It's off the bottom there. These letters can't move. They call this a lock up. These letters aren't going anywhere. They're literally locked into place. A lot of times they're locked from the left and right too. We'll look at that. So it's kind of like this. It's like this design that I'm doing in Illustrator here. My intention is for this design to be exactly like this trivial to do. I'm using fonts that I know I have available in my parent HTML document. 
uh, and I've just set it and I've exported it and here I had dropped it into CodePen and now I have this typographic lockup happening. You can see that I've added a media query too though. Just because it's locked into place doesn't mean I can't intentionally move things around. So if I look at that video again, uh, you can see the from gets a little too small and so I knock it down and bump up the size a little bit uh, below. So I have responsive design possibilities with this as well as animation possibilities, scripting possibilities, whatever. SVG can set text very nicely. Just a little, you know, the, the in the, in the middle of the triangle here that fades in, that's a lockup. So it will scale nicely uh, if it needs to without breaking the design of it. So <clears throat> Vector can, can come out into the real world as well. I saw this, this tweet by Tammy Brass saying that she's uh, using a software called Inkscape with six to eight year old, or six to eight eighth grade girls uh, and, and showing them this piece of technology called the Epilogue Laser to work on their 2D design projects. First of all, when I see a tweet like that, like, which is an SVG, this thing is an SVG sprite sheet, uh, sadly, on, on Twitter. This one is a, a, a by Anna Tudor that's, you know, it's not exactly the same, but it's pretty close. That was done with a single HTML element, actually, which is a pretty impressive little demo. Here's a similar one by Chris Gannon uh, that is actually animated SVG. But what Tammy was talking about is this piece of operational, you know, this giant weird printer thing that can, like, cut stuff out of materials or engrave materials. But guess what you have to send it? Vector data. You have to send it basically SVG data for it to do its thing. And this was some of the output from her 2D class. They're drawing wolves. Looks like somebody drew like a magic card thing up there in the upper right. Uh, one, my favorite one is this girl who drew a unicorn on another unicorn. So I think the world is going to be fine. Here's a pretty cool demo uh, from the the CSS comp that just ended where they had um, this, these beautiful shapes that were clearly drawn with SVG and filled with these lovely gradients and you can kind of see, well first of all it's responsive design was applied here and that never do they interfere with the text uh, to be read, you know they kind of hide and you can see they're moving around a little bit too, it's really subtle but they're kind of morphing and changing. We can dig in here and look at the, um, the shapes involved and see that right through the dev tools, that path data is being manipulated through JavaScript uh, uh, right there on the page. So the, the, it's basically path data that's rapidly being changed, and that's what's a, making that morphing happen. You know, it's probably a green sock thing. At that conference, they took some of that SVG data that they had and they sent it to this machine, a different machine, which could basically print it. You send this printer SVG data and it will draw it on a page. And it's kind of fun here, like what's the difference between this and any other kind of printer? It's like it's applying ink, you know, like you would with a brush so that there's ink on top of other ink here. You're getting some, you know, IRL blend modes happening here, which is... Uh, Pretty, pretty, pretty sweet. It's an SVG powered robot, they called it. So back to this letterpress thing for me, here's metal type being set at a letterpress shop. And I've joined a local letterpress shop here in my neighborhood. It's a, it's a community shop in which it allows us to, to use their materials and stuff. And it's been lots of fun and I love setting metal type. I've done it a number of times now. It feels, it feels fun because you can roll in there, set some type and print it and in and out of there with the print in that day. But what if you wanted to set some type in a face that they didn't have at the shop or a design that you designed in Illustrator? You can do that as well. This is a thing called a polymer plate, uh, which is based on this company called Boxcar Press uh, uh, in New York. And you send them a design. You send them, guess what, vector artwork um, of your designs. And they send you back uh, like a thing like this. It's basically a polymer plate and it's got, it's got sticky stuff on the bottom of them. You put that sticky stuff on that white gridded thing in the background and now you have like a letterpress plate that you can hit paper with and you can ink up and hit paper with and make your design. So it's got that letterpress look but it's started life as, as vector data. So I did this with the, with the CodePen logo. I used the GreenSock morphing library to morph the shape of the heart into this and actually can handle the holes in the CodePen logo too, but I just it was, it was screwing around doing different stuff. But then I would morph it. I put this timeline feature on there so I could morph it at certain points, stop, went and grabbed the vector data out of the dev tools, dropped that vector data in Illustrator, and then set those things 
uh, you can see my Illustrator document below. I made the shape, you know, lined up the morphing shapes. I sent that to Boxcar and had a plate made. And I set it on our Vandercook press here at, at, at our studio. And then I inked up the rollers of the press. See that red stripe there? And there's a black stripe above it. It's called rainbow striping the press. So when I turned it on, it made a gradient. And then I was morphing shape as well as color, but I was doing it on paper, which is pretty fun. Uh, and then when I, you know, I printed the sheets, uh, they came out like this. They made this lovely thing. So I was working with SVG, but in real life, which is a was a fun little project. So uh, uh, my last thing here to to go through is like, why not use SVG to explain your product on the web? Here's a little demo of a a company that's demoing like how their theme had like a sticky sidebar module, but they were showing me, and they were like excited that they could click to to restyle this thing uh, however they wanted to because they used SVG to do it on the web. DigitalOcean uses SVG to make these beautiful charts and graphs that are kind of like marketing for them, showing off uh, the different things that are possible. They have this concept called a droplet on DigitalOcean. This is explaining it. It's code and it goes into a droplet and it can communicate with other droplets. And They make these uh, compelling animations on brand animated uh, that they use on their site. This is one showing their data centers and stuff. Really cool. Here's one that is explaining how a bicycle differential works, you know, but it's all interactive. It's like, what better than SVG to like explain, you know, a, a, a tricky concept than just, I don't know, allow them to click around and explore that concept. When you send a newsletter uh, in MailChimp, this is what's greeting you, which is a library done with the Snap SVG library and the the hand there is, is SVG data. Here's like a little startup looking animation of being like install our app and communicate with your friends and this kind of thing. Again, perfect for SVG. Uh, this is a concept on a website called Bustle that takes you through uh, a quiz kind of thing. One of those like make the decisions and we'll guide you to the end of it. And this is all designed in SVG and all it's animating really like the cool like, camera zoom in and, in and out effect is animating the view box of the SVG element. Remember I said that's the coordinate system of the SVG? Well imagine if you animated 0, 0, 100, 100 to 0, 0, 200, 200. It, the coordinate system is now twice as big, but it's still occupying the same amount of space. So it's kind of like the camera lifted off a little bit from it. So you can use that uh, and animate it to different values uh, and apply easing to those animations and get this really cool camera zooming look. That's exactly what they're doing here on Bustle. That was explained uh, again by Sarah Drasner on CSS Tricks with the She Built Her Own that, that animates the view box through a question and answer kind of situation. That's really cool. You know, here's just a little animation of a, uh, oops, of a backpack that's kind of building itself. You know, why not describe your physical products with SVG too? This is how a latch works. This is how the pocket works, that type of thing. Here's a couple of more Chris Gannon ones, the ones I kind of leave you with, some really fun little animations that uh, uh, are combining text and meta animating vector points and stuff. Uh, definitely look up Chris Gannon's work. He's, a, he's an amazing illustrator. I love every time he releases a pen. I can't wait to heart the dang thing. So, so many things, right? I hope some of you out there are going to reach for SVG next time. Uh, uh, if you come across a vector situation where you feel like you know it should be SVG, uh, please reach for it and do it. If you want to dig into more of the code and more of this and more of the why, I go way more into depth in a book that I have recently written and released called Practical SVG. That should be pretty easy to Google. It's from A Book Apart. So thanks, everybody, for listening to the, the show. I think I have a little bit of time to do some questions um, if you have a few, uh, too much, so I have to hop up pretty quick, unfortunately. All right. Um, yeah, I think we had a few questions. If you have um, a couple yeah, minutes to spare, sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back to our kind of um, cover slide, and then I'll dive right into it. All right, um, so just digging them up. Sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. I have this question. 
Yeah, so so we have one from, um, and sorry if I'm not pronouncing this right, uh, Mukish, which says, when we have multiple instances of a symbol, do we still have the ability to control each individual instance, i.e. fill different colors? That's an awesome question because the answer is actually kind of tricky in that you do, but you have to be tricky about it. So let's say you have a symbol and you have a path inside of that symbol. Uh, in, in, in that symbol, the path had a fill color applied right on it. That screws you right there, unfortunately. Now you can't control each individually. The trick is to leave the fill data off of that path entirely. And then what you do is you apply the fill color, you know, where you go SVG use, you apply the, the fill color to the SVG that has the use in it, and it'll be like, I don't have a fill color, so I'm willing to accept a cascading through me fill color. So if you leave the, the colors off, first of all, you get black by default anyway, which sometimes is fine, but it allows you then to set the fill color from the parent element, so that way, I don't know, you can apply color. So it's a little tricky because that works with fill, but it doesn't work with absolutely everything, and you kind of have to you know, make sure you're careful when you set it up. But yeah, you should have that ability, and in fact, there's a trick to get two colors out of that too, uh, exploiting the idea of current color in, in CSS. So. Uh, you know, you know, that's a really easy thing to Google. Look up S two color SVG current color or something, and you'll find a blog post that explains that. Awesome. Um, this one's come up from a few different people, and it's about browser support for SVG. Um, people in the audience are wondering, uh, so like, so what kind of browser support currently exists, uh, especially in things like Internet Explorer nine and up, as well as. Uh, what should people do in situations where older versions of browsers might not support SVG? Yeah, I mean, that's legit too. It's, you know, like I said in the beginning of it, it's pretty darn good. But certainly some people, have, you know, at where they work, have really strict requirements of how they need to fall back. Um, uh, and if that's super far back, if that's like IE8 or something, first of all, look into Grunticon. That has really good fallbacks. But you know, I, 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 you know, it's it's too bad that I always have to punt to CSS tricks. But there's an there's an epic article on CSS tricks that explains how to do a fallback for all of the different ways you can possibly use SVG. And it's nuanced because SVG is nuanced. Like I opened the talk saying you can use SVG in the image tag. Well, if you do that, there's a specific way you have to deal with the fallback. If you're using inline SVG, there's a specific way you have to deal with the fallback. If you're using SVG through the object tag, which we didn't even look at, that ha has a really easy fallback mechanism. So this post, which you know we can link up here in chat, or I'll make sure it's available, is just SVG fallbacks. If you find, if you even if you Google that and and find the article on CSS tricks, it's I point to it all the time because it covers the nuanced situation that is fallbacks for SVG. In fact, my favorite way is to not use SVG unless I'm in a situation where I don't have to worry too much about fallbacks. I mean, you can look at the Shopify website. They're using SVG. It doesn't look like there's that big of a fallback situation in place because they feel apparently strong enough that it doesn't really need one. Awesome. Uh, we just have one from Jeremy now who says, uh, do you have any tips for avoiding heavy CPU usage when infinitely animating an SVG? Uh, and does path complexity or scale make a difference in that usage? I think it probably does. I don't have a lot of data on that, but certainly like if you use a, a really huge piece of SVG that, you know, just like a megabyte of SVG path data and drag it out of the browser, it's not that well optimized, it can be a drag, and, you know, there's a reason that, like, no games are ever programmed in SVG. They always use Canvas or uh, WebGL or something. It's just SVG is, like, known for being not super performant in that way. If it's just, like, I don't know, I'm animating, I'm shape morphing, and I'm using GreenSock for performance anyway, it's generally fine. But, like, if you're planning on going just absolutely hog wild with complex path data changing stuff in the browser, SVG is not known for being super great in that way. So, yeah, I would, you know, it's a fun thing to animate, but there, there are limits, and I don't know how to tell you other than you'll have to probably find those limits for yourself, you know, generally. Yeah, do you find that there's any limitations of using SVG in uh, mobile applications, like on a performance side of things? Uh, I mean, I, I, mean, I guess that stuff would apply, you know, like the, the, if I'm telling you don't go hog wild with a crazy animation, that, that limit is probably even lower with mobile, but you have less room to 
go crazy anyway. So, you know, usually what I see with SVG animation is like I'm changing a hamburger icon into an X or I'm doing a little morph here or there. I'm drawing some lines, you know, like I tend to not see, you know, 10-minute scenes of SVG star fields flying around, you know. I, I, I don't know where the, the line is, but I feel like it, the line must be somewhere that's fairly intuitive because people generally do the right thing, you know. And I think if you if you have a situation where you're like, oh shoot, um, this is this isn't performing very well, you know, you may just have hit one of those blocks where you're like, I went too far. I'm gonna have to go back and do something else. Maybe make it a movie instead or something. <laughs> um, would you say there are any like hard and fast rules of of when not to use an SVG? Well, I mean, I I don't know. I mean. So if it, I do have a there is a you know, little chapter in the book that 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 is show that talks about the gray area in between, and there there is some you know there's like obvious situations like you're looking at a photograph that will never be SVG it's not intended to be SVG and then there's like a Mickey Mouse logo and it's clearly that should always be SVG it's perfect for SVG, and then there's like intense, you know, there's like a pine, a really detailed pine tree that looks like, oh gosh, that could be a vector, but there's so many little pine needles on there that's like, the file size is going to be really big, it's going to be way bigger than if I just made it a PNG. There's some gray area that you just got to kind of feel out, you know, and, and I think that becomes more and more obvious the more you work with it. Awesome. Um, and I guess we'll take one last question. I'm sorry to those of you who we haven't had a chance to uh, answer all of them. Um, but this one comes from uh, Christian and they're asking, uh, are there any possibilities to pass uh, real-time data through inline SVG uh, using the element? Um, you know, I feel like I've seen situations where you use like the query string and like if you are using inline SVG and you're using it on your own site so you're comfortable with like executing JavaScript inside the SVG that it can then like look at the query string it was called from and then like pull the data out of it and then replace some of its text with the calendar with like the date kind of thing. I bet it's kind of possible, you know, or just like you're using inline SVG anyway so just the JavaScript that the entire page has can can get that, so you, you don't need to pass data down through it. You can just reach into it and say, hi, element, set your inner HTML to this, please. You know, you may not have to be very tricky with it. You can just explicitly grab it with JavaScript. Do what you will with it. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for, for listening to my session. If you do have more questions that I didn't get to, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just available by, I'm just chriscoyer at gmail.com. Feel free to email me directly if you'd like, or there's forums on CSS tricks where you can ask questions and stuff and happy to hear from anybody. That's awesome. And as we said before, we'll be sharing a copy of the recording as well as Chris's presentation and some of the URLs he shared uh, in about a week or so. So if you uh, did want to dig a little deeper, I should have all the information you need to in the follow-up email. Um, with that being said, though, I want to thank Chris for taking the time uh, to be here with us today. Uh, it was a super awesome and insightful presentation, and I'm glad that you could have been here. So thank you. Yep. Thanks very much. We'll see you later.